this is uh, County Commissioner District 3 that you are in. And uh, at this point, I want to bring up uh, El Paso County Commissioner Stan Vanderwerf, who, who represents this area and uh, was kind of instrumental in pulling together uh, all of these folks from different agencies to come up and uh, at least share the information that we have available tonight. Uh, thank you very much, Dave. And first of all, just want to express my appreciation to all of you for coming tonight because uh, there, I believe there's some very important information uh, that you'll be able to uh, listen to here. And we will be asking for questions and feedback um, you know, through the course of this meeting. And in particular, at the end, we want to make sure we answer uh, all of your questions. Uh, one, what happened, of course, is uh, we know that we've had some, some congestion problems, some serious congestion problems up here in this area, even before the COG Railway closure uh, just because the, the, the Pikes Peak Highway is such a popular tourist attraction. And really, the design of the roads were not necessarily designed with that level of traffic in mind. Uh, they were designed many years before. And then upon uh, the public announcement of the closure of the Cog Railway, that really became a catalyst to uh, actually uh, uh, talk to several of the other public agencies and get really specific about some specific actions that we are going to have to do this season. Uh, because of that. I do want to mention that I think it's very important to uh, recognize the need of the Broadmoor to, to close the railway for now and to go through an evaluation. Uh, that Cog Railway is over 120 years old and, uh, and the last thing we need in our community is the reputation of harming people from our tourist attractions. That's just a bad idea and they need to do a proper and full safety evaluation. So while that's tough uh, for, for everybody because of that, and I can tell you I enjoyed going up the Cog Railway, that was the way I would always go to the top of the peak when I had relatives here. It was necessary, in my view, for them to do that so that we don't accidentally hurt somebody through some of our tracks. Now, for this meeting tonight, we have several uh, public agency representatives that we've been interacting with, and each of them is going to come up here tonight. And let me talk about briefly uh, who all of those are. Uh, we're going to have uh, Jack Glavin, the superintendent for the Pikes Peak Highway, Pikes Peak America's Mountain. He's going to talk about the specific actions that the city of Colorado Springs has enacted already and some other actions that they will still do. And it's very, very important that you as local residents hear what these are and have an opportunity to interact with these public agencies, particularly if you might uh, have additional suggestions. Uh, there's, a, there's a big list, and I'll, I'll leave it for Jack to describe what those are, but there's a big list that the city is doing to help alleviate some of that traffic congestion. Uh, then we also will have uh, Mr. Rob Hefner from the Manitou Cliff Dwellings. And while that might not necessarily have a direct impact up here in the Cascade area, he's going to talk about some of the things he's doing because he is a tourist attraction down at the bottom of Ute Pass. And, it, and there, there is a, a relationship to the congestion on Highway 24 for those that go into uh, the Manitou Cliff Dwellings. We also will have Jennifer Irvine from El Paso County, our chief engineer, talk to you about the specific actions that the county will be taking to try to deal with uh, the, the traffic challenges that we have here. And there's a series of actions in that, so you'll get to hear that as well. <clears throat> and then we will also have the Colorado Department of Transportation and Mr. Mark Andrew talk to you about the specific actions that CDOT will also take. Now, all of these actions to get, oh, actually, then we'll also have the Colorado State patrol, and I understand Captain uh, Lupton can't be here, but he has a sergeant here that will, Sergeant Newsom that will talk uh, about that. And then we'll finish with uh, Lisa Bachman, who's going to talk about setting up a communication environment where you can communicate with her so that we can get additional suggestions from the community about how to improve the situation uh, into the different public agencies. <clears throat> now, all of these uh, uh, series of actions that you're going to hear about tonight, any one of them individually might not have a big change. But I think when you see collectively the large number of actions that are being taken, it's my firm belief that it will have a, a, a positive impact uh, to the traffic congestion challenges that we have in this area that relate to uh, the Pikes Peak Highway. Whether or not they completely, uh, completely alleviate the traffic, that's probably a tougher uh, uh, um, uh, item to conclude. But I think we will 
see a positive impact through the collective activity. And I think the key, one key thing to take away from this is what I see as cooperation amongst the different public agencies to try to affect a positive output uh, for the challenges that you have. And just so you know, one last thing, after the uh, Cog Railway closure, I did get about 20 emails from citizens in the area here. Several of you might be in the room. I just want to say thank you for your input. That was very important to me because when I get that kind of uh, feedback from citizens, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very helpful because in fact there were a couple of good suggestions in some of those emails and I have presented those, sec those suggestions to the relevant public agencies uh, and uh, we're working on some of those things right now. So sometimes the best ideas come from you about how to solve local community problems. So I would encourage you to keep doing that and, and do it frequently because they're very, very helpful. And um, there'll be other people here you can send those emails to but feel free to send them to me I'll make sure they get to the right place that can have the best uh, effect. So that's uh, what we're going to do tonight. And I think at this point, I would like to uh, 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 give up the floor to Jack Glavin from the Pikes Peak America's Mountain. Is he, um, where is he? There he is. Okay. And uh, he's from the city of Colorado Springs. And he's going to talk to you about the specific actions that they are taking to try to deal with the traffic flow challenges that we have here. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, good evening. Thank you all for coming here tonight and hopefully getting a little insight on how we hope to help alleviate some of the traffic. Um, what I want to do is talk about some statistics and then some of our strategies. Dave. Okay. This is um, a quick overview of the attendance for Pikes Peak, America's Mount, and the North Pole or Santa Claus, uh, North Pole, Santa Claus. And this is the average attendance in a weekend. So May, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, last weekend in May, June, and this is the Friday, Saturday, Sunday average. So if you want to take those three days, you can see that in June, roughly just over 10,000. That's roughly 3,000 visitors a day, and that's visitors that we do. Obviously skewed more towards a Saturday than a Friday or a Sunday, but basically the average. So you can see what happens in July. So we go up between us almost 15,000. To equate that to vehicles then, it's approximately in the big months, 2,000 vehicles a day would go up through the Pikes Peak Highway from Fountain, Fountain up through there. So that's kind of what the traffic is we're gonna deal with. And if the cog closure, we're gonna see it obviously a little bit more increase, we think, on the highway side. Next slide. So here's our strategies that we're gonna try to implement. If you think about our gateway, we have three gates. We're gonna open all three at 7.30. 7.30 is when we welcome visitors to the Pikes Peak Highway. So we're gonna open all three at that time. By 10 o'clock, we're gonna increase the visitor, the rangers down at the gate. So we're gonna have double the amount of rangers. So instead of three gates, we're gonna have extra rangers in front of them that's gonna welcome visitors. So you're gonna have a tr you know, approximately six rangers out there. So we're gonna double that capacity. Right now, we try to average less than a minute per transaction. So we're hoping to get over 250 transactions, which equates to vehicles for us through the Pikes Peak Highway. Um, we increased the staff, as I said. We're, increasing, we're promoting the online sales. So pikespeakcolorado.com, you can go there, buy your tickets, so they'll speed you through the gate. Uh, the, the approved buses, we have bus tours, Gray Line's running, you've probably heard that. There's gonna be nine other shuttle services that do have tourist service provided to the summit of Pikes Peak. So all those are gonna be required basically to purchase online. So again, the transaction's gonna be very complete. They're gonna give us a pass. They're already paid. They're gonna get through the gate very quickly on that. We've aligned, realigned the gateway. If you think about it, we used to have one lane going into two. Now, through past the curve, we have th all three lanes are gonna be queued into those three gates. What that's gonna do is increase our capacity down through to what we call North Pole entrance. We can hold approximately 100 vehicles in that queue. So we're gonna try to get everybody that's visiting us above the North Pole entrance. Then their visitors should be able to get to their parking lots. Um, 
We've installed fiber at the gate, so we've upgraded our IT capacity, which is gonna speed up our network. And also we're looking at a wireless point of sale. If you think about where we are, we're kind of in a little bowl, so we don't get good connection, but we've already got new hotspots connected. We're, we're trying out new handheld credit cards. So those rangers that are walking the line will be able to take credit cards and cash. So that hopefully will speed it up as well. Um, and then we're working with the officials on Highway 24 and what's gonna happen if we start seeing backups that may be influenced by Pikes Peak Highway. So that's our summary of what we're trying to do uh, this summer. Uh, I think Jennifer is going to do a little pinch hitting here for uh, cliff dwellings. Uh, Jennifer Irvin is uh, El Paso County's uh, chief engineer, county engineer, and uh, she's been in communications with those folks. They couldn't make it tonight, but uh, she'll give you a little overview of what they're doing down the hill. So uh, Jennifer Irvin, county engineer, but uh, as Dave said, I'm pinch hitting for the for the Manitou Cliff Dwellings, and although they they are a little bit removed from the hill, um, they um, really do have a, an impact on the corridor as well. So uh, what they've included, similar to the Pikes Peak America Mountain, is their visitation. They're showing their visitation per month over the last few years, and as you can see, their highest um, visitation is during the July season, typically. So um, go ahead, Dave. And they have some strategies as well that they are working on. Um, their wolf days are, are really the uh, highest days, uh, busiest days. So what they're doing is that they're changing those event start times to, to change it to a different peak hour so that they help ease congestion along the corridor. Um, and they're also changing those days to non-holiday weekends to help ease congestion because they know that those are the busiest weekends as well. Uh, another thing too is uh, based upon some of the, the work that the Pikes Peak America Mountain is doing, they're also looking to change how they um, pay for those entrances as well and, and looking at getting um, some additional credit card terminals at their front gate to, to assist as well. Um, they are working to look at offering discounts and coupons uh, to those who visit during non-peak hours so that they can kind of promote making sure that people are coming in um, during those nine peak days and hours, and that's in process. And then they are also coordinating uh, with CDOT, starting to have some discussions with CDOT about looking at their entrance to the facility and see if there's uh, additional improvements that can be made or, or looking at some different ways to help with that congestion at that intersection as well. And, and then again, they are part of the team that are looking at this corridor to try and affect positive change. So I think that they're, they're a partner and and we appreciate working with them as well. Um, as far as El Paso County, um, we've been working very hard with all of the corridor stakeholders as well. Um, we're having this community meeting and I just wanna thank you all for being here and also our partners in this process. Um, uh, the, the best thing you can give us is your time and so we just wanted to uh, make sure that uh, we're communicating with you and I appreciate everybody being here. One of the things, and I'll have a slide after this, is that we are looking at doing some immediate improvements, um, some small improvements, but we're hoping that they're gonna be able to make a big change at the intersection. And, and I'll show you that afterwards in the next slide. Um, we are coordinate coordinating with CDOT on possibly extending the left turn lane on US 24 going into Fountain Avenue. And um, I know that CDOT will be, is prepared to talk about that. And then we're also coordinating with CDOT and all the other stakeholders on looking at long-term improvements to uh, Highway 24. And so, uh, and again, we are partnering with all these agencies as well to try to make sure that we affect positive change. Um, want to talk a little bit about our concept, and, and this is a very early conceptual improvement right there at the intersection. One of the things that we are seeing is um, uh, a lot of issues with people exiting because there's only one lane in and one lane out right at the intersection at US 24. And so it, it's a little hard to see, but um, essentially what we're looking at is um, 
uh, trying to get in a third lane across the bridge so that we have a separate right turn lane and, and making sure that we have some good signing and striping. Um, one of the things that we know is that people, as they're exiting, don't really know that you have that kind of frontage road to be able to go down and then enter onto Highway 24 to kind of skip the the, the signal. So we're going to try to um, do some signing and striping to uh, make sure that people are able to um, and know that they can kind of avoid the signal and, and stop all that stacking, which is causing a big traffic problem. Again, this is very conceptual. Um, CDOT has gone ahead and started um, survey on this. Uh, the city of Colorado Springs is working with us. Um, they have hired a design engineer, and we are hoping to finish a design so that we can implement this still this summer. Um, we still we think that it, it is we are able to do that, and um, more to come on this, but this is a great concept that uh, will provide, we think, some short-term improvements while we plan for some of the longer-term improvements. And uh, I'll let you introduce Mark. So CDOT, uh, already doing some work in uh, Highway 24, and, uh, and we, we never are... Uh, we're never disparaging of getting work done on the highway, right? <laughs> we can use all the highway work we can get done. Uh, but this did kind of throw them a little bit of a, of a, of a curve. So if you want to uh, come over, Mark, and uh, ch share with us a little bit about uh, the projects that you've got underway and, uh, and how we can uh, work together to kind of make it all work smoothly. Okay. If you could advance that one slide. Yeah. I'm Mark Andrew. I'm the North Program Engineer for Region 2 for CDOT. Um, it's hard to believe that this intersection of Cascade was was built, I think, 2001, 2002. It's, it's really not that old, but with the growth that we're seeing all across Colorado, which is a good thing, um, we're seeing a lot of congestion points, and this is, this is one of them. And uh, one of the things that CDOT wants to really focus on in the next few years is trying to get projects ready if funding comes along. So um, we're looking at, at putting some money into the corridor if we were to get funding. We're, right now we don't have any, but if we were to get some, um, this may be one of the intersections that we make some big improvements on. And like Jennifer said, there's some things that we can do in the interim, and we are partnering with the city and the county to, to come up with these inner improvements. They're mainly striping improvements, but they will help the egress movements coming onto US 24. To get off of 24, um, we are looking at maybe extending that left turn lane that would go from westbound to southbound. Um, we think we can get more vehicles stacked in that left turn. There's an overhead sign we've got to move um, that uh, we've got to figure out where to move that and then some concrete barrier rework and restriping to extend that left turn lane. But we think there's some room in there to do that. That's still a short term. Um, Long term would be looking at e extending those lanes even further, adding additional turn lanes, things like that, or even coming up with some more innovative at grade intersections. Um, don't want to get into those details, but bottom lines, we, we want to be able to look, look at options to move traffic in and out of that intersection much more efficiently than we're seeing it right now. We will look at the, the traffic phasing, um, or uh, excuse me, the the signal timing to see if we can make some improvements, especially for that left turn in, uh, to add more green time potentially to that. It would take away from green time for uh, the, the eastbound movement, but during those peak periods, uh, we want to dedicate more traffic going in. So we'll look to do those things this summer. Um, those, are, those are more short-term strategies. Uh, Long-term, um, like I suggested, we we'll look at the entire corridor. We do have um, work coming up this year. What we decided to do is postpone the majority of the work that's occurring in the corridor to this fall. For example, we had some flood repair work uh, up by the Montessori School. Um, we had a wall that, that uh, got um, undermined and we need to fix that wall. So we're gonna wait to do that after the, the, the fall season. Uh, we will need to take a lane for that, so that's why we want to wait. Um, we do have work at Ridge Road and 31st Street 
uh, to improve those lanes, those turn lanes, and add some safety elements at those intersections. Um, but we think the majority of the work is going to be occurring outside of traffic. We're not taking lanes during the day. Um, if we do, it'll be at night. So that work is about ready to start. Um, and then in addition to that, we do have um, a fiber, fiber optic project scheduled. Uh, we're looking at a late June advertisement, but we're looking at postponing that work until this fall as well. And that's, that's something that CDOT and the communities up here would, would really benefit from, from better communication in, in that technology. So um, that's coming. Um, and then there's one more project, um, the Rockfall project. Now that project we cannot delay. Um, what we need to do is build rockfall fences, what you, similar to what you see out there now, but extending those rockfall fences. We, we've had too much debris on the road. We continue to have that debris on the road, which closes the road after rain events. So we want to uh, install some more barrier, some more netting up on the rocks uh, to, to help alleviate that. So that's, that's going to be a positive impact for safety, and, and um, we won't have to close the road for those events. Um, so with that, um, those are the projects we've got coming up. That rockfall project will um, mainly occur, um, well, it will occur during off-peak hours. So from 9 to 3, um, we're not, we're going to work mainly in those hours. We won't work uh, on the heavy weekends and certainly not during the peak uh, hill climb event. So starting the, the third, second week in June through... Um, the first of July, we're going to stay clear of that that period. So, again, that that's a, that's the last project that we've got coming up. I don't have the exact locations. We are going to have a website developed that will give you information about all these projects coming up, and we're coordinating with Bachman uh, PR to help us with that. So, we'll uh, you'll be able to access that. You'll be able to access closure times and things like that. But again, we're. Our focus is to get that work done independent of the heavy traffic. We've got the state patrol, right? Yeah. So if we could have uh, the sergeant come up. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, you know, while the sergeant comes up, there's always two things that we always want to keep in mind when we're making these changes. Um, the first and, and foremost, the primary one, is about citizen safety. Uh, we, have to, we have to work on that. And I know that some of these improvements, I think, are going to improve uh, safety. And then the second one is, you know, the inconveniences, the uh, wait times that you experience in trying to get through these roads based on the heavy traffic. So that is, uh, that's a top priority as well. It is second to safety, but it's an important one as well. And I'll hand this over to the Colorado State Patrol. How are we doing? I'm the only guy in uniform, so this kind of feels like an intervention. Uh, <laughs> I, I promise I can quit any time. <laughs> um, State Patrol's been pretty active with all the partnerships in this situation. Um, working hand in hand with Pikes Peak, uh, we've kind of come up with a plan to uh, really target uh, a stretch of road from milepost 290 to milepost 300. Uh, if anybody's familiar with those mileposts, that's about 31st Street all the way up to just past the intersection. Um, troopers will be out in force uh, targeting aggressive driving, DUI. I mean, this is stuff we do every day. Uh, but we're going to have one extra unit dedicated and paid for by Pikes Peak, America's Mountain, to have up there during peak times. Um, what will happen is, is when we see traffic starting to back up uh, onto the interstate or the highway and we think it's going to start affecting and major flow through there, we give them a call and they're going to put in their steps to mitigate that and, and try and move the traffic up off the, uh, the highway for us. <laughs> This is just a few numbers, and I apologize for that being so small. Uh, I'll blame that on my captain. He's the one who put this together. Um, he's old, so he must have had his reading glasses on when he did this. Um, but you, you look at the numbers uh, compared from first quarter to last year to the first quarter of this year. Uh, we've seen some great efforts and some stride in, in reducing some of the, the more serious fatal and injury accidents. Um, we, you'll see a little bit of a drop here, though, when you look at citations for seatbelt speeding, felony arrest, stuff like that. Um, we're working a little shorthanded. I always tell people that numbers will give you a brief synopsis of what we do, but it doesn't paint the entire picture. There's too many other mitigating factors that will change those numbers from year to year. Weather, traffic volume, injured troopers, troopers on family medical leave, stuff like that. 
Um, but we are out there protecting every day, trying our best. Um, I would encourage any of you guys that are coming up to pass, if you see any dangerous driving or anything like that, dial star 277 from your cell phone, star CSP. That gets a hold of our comm center. Let us know, give us a direction of travel, vehicle description, plate number, if you can identify the driver. If we've got a trooper in the area, we love stopping that stuff. And we will write a citation based off of what you saw. If you're willing to sign the agreement, we'll write the citation. If it goes to court, we'll bring you in. You'll be our star witness. We'll prosecute it and then hopefully get a conviction. We just wanna change driving behavior. You know, usually you do that through creating a significant emotional event. Sometimes just a talking to somebody creates that significant emotional event. Sometimes hitting them in the pocketbook creates that significant emotional event. So um, I think there's one more. That might be the last one. Nope. Um, guys, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, I'd like to bring up uh, Lisa Bachman. And uh, it's my understanding she's uh, been uh, retained by uh, CDOT to actually... Uh, in work on the communications with the community here and all of the different types of uh, projects that, that we're going to be doing. And uh, one of the things that, I, I mentioned it earlier, one of the things that would be very important, um, we did this with the West Side Area Action Plan, the West Colorado Construction. That's a big project down there. If you've driven through there, you know, uh, there's an enormous amount of work. The end state of that will be wonderful, but a key to what was, what's been beneficial in that construction project is the communication to the residents that live in the area. Uh, for example, the businesses there get communications now about when there are road closures or challenges or when there's gonna be barricades, these kinds of things. And that allows them, we found out, for example, that sometimes when there's a road closure and the business doesn't know about it, um, they bring in a full workforce because it's a tourist day, but the road is closed in such a way that they, they don't need all of their employees. So for business owners who uh, are um, well informed about what's going on in the construction, uh, that can be very, very helpful uh, for everybody to know in advance. So what Lisa's gonna do is uh, work with you all to ensure that we have this effective communication flow about the projects that will be going on here and you, the residents that live here. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. So yes, I'm Lisa Bachman. I work with uh, Colorado Department of Transportation, with El Paso County, with Pikes Peak, America's Mountain, uh, in different capacities, all under the umbrella, though, of communication and information. Because as the Commissioner said, you know, if you don't know what's going on, it's frustrating. If you do know what's going on, it's still frustrating, but at least you can figure out how to cope. So um, these entities have gotten together and decided, you know, rather than businesses and residents in the areas, having to call six different organizations or figure out which one to call for your question, uh, they came up with the idea of let's have one hotline number, you pass hotline number. <clears throat> Excuse me, so that's the number you see up here. So please take note of that. And um, I won't, my team and I won't have all your answers, uh, but we'll know where to send you. And that's what we're looking at this phone number to be, is kind of a clearinghouse to help direct you to the right place so you're not calling around trying to figure it out. Um, and as uh, was said, we'll also look at a, a putting a website up so all the information can be under one umbrella. And then we'll send out periodic e emails and update you on the project. So if you did not sign in tonight, please do so. And if you provide your email address, that's how we can then send you out these periodic updates, project updates. Um, so that's really all I have to say at this point. We don't have a website set, so there's no e a URL for that yet, but we'll communicate that up as soon as we have it. So, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, we will certainly uh, keep you appraised of all of that on the El Paso County website, www.elpasoco.com. Uh, we are also uh, uh, engaged in a, a very active uh, video uh, campaign uh, through our Facebook channel, uh, advising folks of uh, what's going on over there on the West Avenue action. Uh, we'll crank up that effort as well to uh, try to help things go a little bit more smoothly uh, as we as we move into the Ute Pass area. So that's kind of the, uh, the, the heart and soul of the information that we had to share with you. Um, we do have one microphone that is uh, located here. And um, 
Uh, you know, it, it usually works okay in a circumstance like this. If you'd like to just step up to the microphone, if you have some questions, we'll try to bring up uh, people. We would like to have you on the microphone, however, because this is being recorded and will uh, and will be available for folks who weren't able to make it here. Okay, if you could give us your name and kind of uh, ask a question, and we'll we'll see if we can get somebody uh, fielded to it to at least consider it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Susan Solianus. I'm a Cascade resident, and I'm very impressed with the details that have been given us and, and the improvements that are being made. My comment is simply that they all appear to uh, benefit the tourist, that one-time visitor, um, and I want that one-time visitor to have a great day. But every day, I have to turn left from the sunny side of Cascade across to go east downtown. And what I heard was that I will lose green time on that left turn for the benefit of the tourists. I did not hear very many, if any, suggestions that benefit those of us who travel Highway 24 every single day. If, if I could, uh, let's try to respond to each question as they come up, if you don't mind. So I just want to make sure I understand um, what it is that, so that we can provide a proper answer. So it is the Fountain Avenue, Highway 24 interchange you're referring to, or is it a different one? That interchange, the interchange with the light, but I'm not talking about Fountain Avenue. I'm talking about the other side of the highway, ah, coming right. from the post office side, trying to go east downtown. Right. Okay. So, uh, so you're trying to. That's where you're trying to make the left-hand turn. You betcha. And, yeah. Appreciate it. And there are uh, obviously right. You're one of them. There are residents that live over there. And uh, as the uh, um, as the uh, uh, the green time is added for the tourism to get in, which would reduce the traffic in that intersection, it will do something about your ability to get out of that intersection, right? So um, I am not a light engineer, a traffic engineer. I don't know if, um, Jack, you might want to uh, take that. If, is there a way to deal with that? Or if there isn't a good answer from us, then what we want to do is we want to record that question and also make sure that you signed in in the back because when we get an answer, we'll send it to every email uh, that we have a record of. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Sure, no problem. Hello, my name is Jason. I'm the uh, traffic engineer with CDOT. So that's a great question. So I think when we would extend that left turn is when it's the highest. So I think Saturday, it wouldn't be a full-time reduction in that green time. It's just when it's needed. So I hope that kind of helps alleviate any... Yeah, intersection. Just that all the way down to highway. Yeah. So you're getting on the highway and just getting stuck on the highway. Okay. Well, uh, I, I, I can appreciate the challenge that you have there. Uh, I actually go over there fairly often uh, because the is I forget the name of the pizza place, but their pizza is awesome. <laughs> and yeah, backdoor pizza. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, I really enjoy buying their pizza, uh, you know, like ordering it on the phone, picking it up and then continuing west uh, if I'm going into the mountains to do mountain climbing. So I actually go over there and buy pizza from those guys because their pizza is fantastic. But thank you. So we've taken that question and we'll see if we can get a little bit answer. But obviously part of it is during the, during the high peak parts of when the tourists are going up the mountain, you know, it, there's going to be a challenge. But in the other days when we don't have that, you'll, you'll revert back to something hopefully that will be more amenable to the residents. Okay. Sir, you had a question. Yeah. David Perlman, Green Mountain Falls. I'm in the uh, tourism business. Um, I have a few concerns about all the things that were said. One, the main problem is, is the COG railway closing. Okay, this is going to create a serious problem. One thing that I'm concerned about is that you're talking about gateways. There's still a one-lane traffic going up to the mountain. We're still going to have backup traffic. I've seen this backup traffic before. CDOT is talking about projects that are going back 
uh, going forward in the future, not for this season. I'm concerned about this season with the cog railway being closed. The state police is telling us how they're going to be on the job going up and the, the, the state police don't have to worry. Traffic isn't going to be moving. It, it's, it's a real serious concern for tourism this year. Uh, cars slow down and practically to a stop have caused forest fires along the highway. Just last week we had a six or seven forest fires that we had to put up. Uh, not forest fires, excuse me. Uh, fires along the highway that we had to put out from cars that could have been cigarettes being thrown out. It could have been muffler, hot muffler. But everything that I've heard tonight is not a solution to the traffic problem we're going to have. The engineer is talking about green lanes. There's going to be more traffic coming up and down this highway because of the closing of the, rail, of the COG railway than we've ever had before. So. I, I, I appreciate your comment. And my, my, my thinking to that... I heard it's going to solve. Yeah. It's, it's difficult to know um, entirely what all of these proposed changes are ultimately going to do. I think some of them, though, will have a very positive effect. But to your point, okay, the closure of the COG railway, uh, it's, my, it's my belief that's going to bring a lot of traffic over here that would not otherwise be here, right? And you know, there, there's impacts in Manitou Springs because uh, the Cog Railway was a tax revenue source for them. So, so, you know, they have kind of the opposite side of a challenge uh, down there. So there's an impact in Manitou Springs as well. But some of, the th some of the actions that the city is doing, and I don't mean to speak for the city, so you all, uh, f from the city, you can correct me if I say it wrong. Uh, but they are uh, increasing the, the number of tourist providers, uh, some of whom are going to operate down in the Colorado Springs area where people will pay to go to the top of the mountain, get on a, a bus or a van in Colorado Springs, and instead of eight vehicles or 15 vehicles going up the Pikes Peak Highway, it'll be one vehicle. Uh, it'll be a bigger vehicle, but it won't be 10 or 15 vehicles. Uh, that'll be part of, of this. The other thing that I've thought that I've always felt was important is speeding up the gate uh, at the entrance to America's Mountain. And there's a series of actions that the city is is doing. Uh, we saw it. Um, um, uh, they were expressed here. And I did actually travel up uh, Pikes Peak uh, yesterday because uh, my daughter graduated from high school on Sunday, so I had friends here from New Jersey, and I wanted to bring them up to the mountain. So I actually showed up at uh, 8 o'clock. Uh, and they did have all three gates open, which I think in previous years, they didn't always have that. So that third gate's gonna help. I think there's another point that's important to be made. One of the challenges they had at that gate, they didn't have high-speed internet access, which meant the transactions were slower in the past. So these transactions to buy a ticket to go up the mountain are gonna be faster, uh, and that is going to help. Um, I also made another recommendation to the city, which I know is uh, problematic for the city uh, to do. And in fact, it came from one of you, from one of the residents here, and I forwarded it to the city. And that was to move the gate up to, is it, is it called Catamount Reservoir or the reservoir that's up there? Uh, Crystal Reservoir. And uh, that would then uh, use more of the highway itself as, as uh, the place to, to uh, handle the vehicles and get more of those vehicles out of that intersection, the 24 Fountain Avenue intersection, right? But that's, that requires a, a, a bigger effort because that means building a, a toll gate up there and, and other kinds of things. So perhaps that's a consideration for the future. But what I can say is that the city has, is doing a series of specific things that's going to speed up that gate, which has been slow in the past. You know, part of why the gate was slow is that the people at the gate would also give the safety briefing about driving up the mountain. You know, make sure you're careful with your brakes and those kinds of things. With the extra rangers in front <clears throat> and the fact that they're going to have uh, those little devices that allow them to uh, sell uh, the tickets to go up, it really has, it will have the, the effectiveness of having more than three gates at the entrance. And I think that's going to go a long way. It is difficult, though, at this time to know how much of a positive impact that will have. I think it will be significant, but we have a significant additional vehicle flow coming from the closure of the COG Railway, so uh, it's hard to ascertain exactly where we're going to be. But I do appreciate the city's efforts to, to, 
to do these kinds of things and try and make that, that speed faster. And we'll have, to, we'll have to monitor and see. Again, you may have other suggestions that we're not aware of or we haven't thought of, and I would be very interested in hearing what those are. Yes, sir. Sir, my name is Chuck Smith. I'm a resident. My question of CDOT, any chance that you could just fill the potholes between here and I-25? I mean, before season starts, the gaps, the potholes, the, the traffic maneuvers, those of us that drive it enough know where they are. Yes. And, and we're man maneuvering, and sometimes that's probably not the best thing to do, but the potholes need to be filled. We'll, we'll, we'll look at those. And um, there's some good news coming um, next year. We're, we're going to do an overlay project that will go from 8th Street to Waldo Canyon. And if there's funding, we'll go all the way to Chapita Park with that overlay. So um, you're going to have a, a fresh new highway. Potholes will be um, a distant memory for many years to come um, until it needs to be resurfaced again. But I hear what you're saying. We've, we're seeing the deterioration on 24, uh, like many roads, and, and it needs to be done. It's time for, for a new surface resurfacing project. But I'll, I'm going to pass that on to our maintenance folks, and, and we'll go out there and see if we can't make some improvements in the next few months, next few weeks. Yes, sir, go ahead. Yes, my name is Newman McAllister. I've lived in Chapita Park since 1972. Although the COG may have been a catalyst for your interest in this matter, the problem existed long before the COG came up. And the problem with the intersection is the bridge. If there are three cars backed up going down uh, from the COG Highway, trying to go to Colorado Springs or Woodland Park, you cannot turn right onto the frontage road. So when we were discussing the Ute Pass Trail, which was a highly controversial issue that we concluded a couple years ago, we continually reminded the county, you cannot safely get people across Fountain Road unless you do something with that intersection. So I think the county has been derelict in not considering enlarging the bridge, rebuilding the bridge, so that you could build a proper right turn lane for people going down the frontage road. So that's for starters. You're a little bit late in getting to this, and you haven't and really sir, offered any, I'm not finished, but okay. you can answer that one question. <laughs> I, I would actually, it sounds like you have uh, several questions, and I definitely want to hear them all, but I would like to respond uh, to that first one, and then we'll go to your second question, all if right. that's well, all right. All right, go ahead so, then. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I did hear this from the residents, and I got to see it myself. Um, so to your point about, what well, was there anything that we were doing, and I, I haven't had a town hall to express this to you all, the residents, but uh, you may all remember uh, the um, ballot measure that we had last fall, which the citizens voted for. And there was $12 million in 2016 money set aside for highways, and $6 million of that went to I-25. And what happened is, because that's such a big issue, that's essentially all that ever got talked about. But the other $6 million of that 12 is going to four other county road projects, and I asked the county to include this intersection as one of those four road projects. So I want you to know last year, I was working on the funding requirements to try to alleviate some of the challenges. Now, some of the specific topics that we were discussing at that time was, how do we get a third lane in there? Uh, you know, what can be done with the current bridge and so forth? Because it was, it was obvious, right? Uh, very easy and very apparent to see, and there were some studies that had been done and proven scientifically Specifically, exactly to your point. You get two cars at that traffic light and that right turn lane ramp onto 24 East is blocked. And that is why uh, Jennifer mentioned about um, adding a third lane. Now there's some, in order to do this quickly, there's some unique things we've got to do. There's, you might be aware, right? As far as road surface right now, there's only two lanes. 
Uh, but then there's a sidewalk on either side, right? So uh, in the process of eliminating the sidewalk, uh, dealing with the sidewalk, we can get to a third lane that becomes a dedicated right turn lane. And that's the short term answer. The long term answer is a new bridge. Uh, but uh, the short term answer to deal with getting that right turn lane, because it's, it's obvious, right? The residents know about the ramp to go east. It's the tourists that don't know. So they just drive up to the traffic light and wait for the light to turn green. So I, I wanted you to be aware that I was very aware of this uh, last year and worked uh, with the other county commissioners to add that intersection into our ballot measure. And it is one of the four uh, 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 that was specifically listed in the other six million that was not the I-25 extension. Well, if you're so going to you. use a sidewalk for a right turn lane, I think all the tourists will need to be on bicycles. Um, to turn right. But I'll go on to the next issue. I appreciate that you're thinking about that. Secondly, the, I think the signage to turn right is inadequate. It's plain to those who live here that if you're a tourist and you're going to Colorado Springs, you ought to turn right. But it's apparently not plain to the tourist. So I appreciate that the county has added one sign which is close to the light, but what you need is, and I'll switch to some humor here, what we need is like Rome has, a nicely uniformed policeman on a pedestal telling people to turn right. All right. I assume the county's not gonna pay for that, and CDOT won't either, so the next best thing would be have a lighted sign with an arrow that says, if you are going to Colorado Springs, Turn here. Yeah, turn here. Do, do not go through the light. So I don't see why that can't be done, and I've suggested that before, and it falls on deaf ears. Okay, ears. so to that one, because you might have a little more, but uh, it, it's we know that the signage is inadequate, and perhaps, Jennifer, if you want to come up, because I know we're going to address that in these... The way I'm kind of describing this intersection, I'll, uh, it, these might not be the best terms, but I call it kind of phase one construction and phase two construction. Phase one are the simpler things that we can do now, and phase two is the final solution, which might be more expensive and it would certainly be at least a few years out, if not more. So Jennifer, if you want to talk about signage. I was trying not to stand up here and act too much like an engineer and talk about all this, all of the things, but um, in addition to the, the pavement improvements, we are going to upgrade all the signing and striping in this area, and one of those signing strategies is to include uh, better advanced signage to make sure that we're redirecting um, those, as, as you mentioned, those citizens, uh, those tourists, um, to that to that right. So, and, and actually. If, um, and it's hard to see, but maybe we can leave this up for everybody to look after you know we f finish with all the questions. But um, essentially, part of our strategy here as well is uh, creating um, what I would call kind of a pork chop uh, to make sure that um, as you're turning right, you're not able to even go to the light. You're redirected down that frontage road. So um, not only are we going to employ some additional signing and striping, but also ensure that with some barriers to make sure that people are redirected down that frontage road. So uh, we think, again, this is, this is not going to solve all the problems, but we think that there are, this is a quick, short-term improvement that we can uh, see some immediate successes with. Thank you. Did you, uh, well, we'll let this gentleman uh, Come up and but if you if you oh, had, have one more sir if you had yeah. any more <laughs> just a final comment I think the yeah. improvements that the Cascade Water District is doing were very badly timed and I hope that the county or or the contractor will repave that portion of the road from Highway 24 up even past their turn off to the peak there because that's also a bottleneck that's been caused by construction oh is it right now while I'm speaking. Oh, what a marvelous well, maybe, society. Maybe not at this Thank moment you. in time, but... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very <laughs> much. It? Okay. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. And uh, for, for everybody, uh, so this gentleman, he had a series of questions. We are here to try to answer every question. So if you have one question or a couple, please come up. I, I do want to try and 
work through every one of them and take uh, take notes about what questions you have. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Gordon Wines. I'm a resident, just live a few blocks away from here, and I kind of want to tail into David Perlman's question and uh, McAllister's uh, question, uh, but I want to talk long term. Um, and, and right up front, CDOT, I think you guys are doing a great job, but it's never good enough. You know that, right? So <laughs> we'd like to see the money spent where we live, and we know that places are growing faster and quicker, and there's, there's greater pressures, but we live here, so we're kind of a little bit myoptic. But when it comes to long-term, um, is, is there a long-term plan for a actual good solution for that Fountain Highway 24 crossing? Because you can hang all the signage in the world, and that dad coming down Pikes Peak Mountain with five screaming kids in the back who just came from Kansas or Oklahoma and has never driven up a hill more than two feet, is all white knuckled, and he's not gonna see that sign. Um, there has, actually has to be an infrastructure change uh, to how that intersection works, and I would, I would encourage you, when, when you come up with a, an infrastructure plan that, uh, there actually is a town meeting where you can talk to some of his residents who see every day what happens. And we may have some good suggestions, we may have some bad suggestions, but we see it every day. And it, we'd love to be able to get our input in. And some of it may be unfeasible, may not even be stupid ideas, but we all see different things. And, uh, I, and I've gone across her both ways. I, I drive my kid down the Fountain Avenue, but I pick up another kid on the sunny side. So I've seen both sides of the intersection. Uh, I know short term, there's no good solution. And a good long term solution would be extremely expensive, get it? But I mean, hey, I, w I want what's good for us. Um, and tailing into that, for those of us who drive up and down 24 every day, I mean, we're all aware of the, the 31st inter intersection for eastbound traffic and 21st uh, westbound traffic on Highway 24, um, real bad congestion. So I'd just like to find out if there is a long-term plan uh, that, you know, maybe not in our lifetimes, but is on the books and is gonna address us. Appreciate and that. Thank you, and I'll, I'll let uh, CDOT respond to those uh, as well. But I know, I'm well aware of the fact that um, uh, this community has definitely has challenges getting across Highway 24. You've got, in addition to residents that live on either side and might be going to a local business that's up here, you also have school buses that travel across 24, and they travel during busy times uh, when people are commuting, let's say, from Woodland Park down into Colorado Springs. So we have this conflux of traffic that uh, as traffic increases, the danger will increasingly increase. So I think that from my point of view, knowing, you know, taking off the cost equation at the moment because um, bridges are expensive, I think ultimately we're gonna need bridging that's going to help the residents deal with that. I think that is part of the long-term answer. And I just don't know when or how soon, but I think that has to be part of it because we have a we have an increasing safety challenge. I think about getting people across the highway. So, um, with that in mind, I'll hand it over to CDOT. But keep in mind, he is here tonight. Get to know him. <laughs> Get his phone number. Sorry, man. <laughs> and and call him frequently and often and remind him. Okay. Thank you. All right, Commissioner, thanks for that. Um, no, call me. I, uh, you know, when we, what this gentleman said is, um, is really important that we hear from the public. W when we do improvements, we want the public's input. Because a lot of times, you guys have some good ideas, and we want, we want to hear those. Um, ultimately, I wish I could say that we're going to build a great separated interchange there. Um, that would that would more than handle the traffic. Um, impact, sure, visual impacts, things like that. That's probably your ultimate, ultimate solution. Um, I can't really go off and say exactly what the improvements are gonna be, because we really haven't um, thought outside of just this season. There's been some discussions about how do we expand the intersection, how do we do um, more left turn lanes, uh, that would have to, we'd have to widen the road at that point. Um, right away is a concern. So there's, there's certainly, uh, our task is to go back soon and start looking at those, what I call interim improvements and then maybe long-term improvements. 
we want to look 20 years in the future, 40 years in the future. What, what do we need to build uh, given the fact that the, the tourism traffic is changing so rapidly? We need to get out in front of that. So we want to look at, at what that might look like. So that's going to involve the county. That's going to involve the city. Um, that's certainly going to involve um, the roadway into Pikes Peak Highway uh, is going to be a, a limiting factor as well. So we've got to look at all the infrastructure around that intersection. So I wish I could tell you exactly what, what we're thinking. Um, but um, outside of a, a grade separated intersection, uh, but other than that, it's it's really adding more capacity to the turn movements, and that's gonna that's gonna take some some capacity or some some right away to do that. Yes. Okay. So um, I'm gonna invite Lisa up here. I'm done. Too. Um, before people start leaving, I just wanted to get this point across that if. If tonight you have some things you would like any of the entities working together here to know, uh, at the sign-in table, uh, some of the, the Monica and uh, Allison are back there, and they'll take your comments down so that you can pass them on. Some people don't want to get up in front of the audience and talk, but we want to hear if you just anything you think we need to know for communicating out, please let us know. And then could I um, ask how many folks are here that are residents? Great. And how many are business owners and or residents together? Okay. Any tourists here? Okay. Two? <laughs> Three? Okay. Well, this isn't meant to exclude our tourists, but I did want to mention that this hotline number that we had up here is really meant for you, for you all, the majority of you, for the residents and businesses. The tourists will have their other ways to find out information. We'll supply information to the tourist organizations, and they can get it out that way. But this number is really for all of you so that you have a place to go so you're not calling six or seven different organizations. Uh, thank you very much. And so, go ahead, sir. What's your question? Uh, my name is Tom Martin, and I live right over there. Um, I would like to start, first start out with some kudos for the State Patrol in the use of the great discretion that they use in using their sirens in Ute Pass when they're pulling over traffic violators. And it's great. It adds to the peace and the quiet of this, this canyon. And I want them to know that that's greatly appreciated. Because they could just go with the sirens and it would just ring through the canyon. And it's so pleasant that they, they use discretion in that way. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. This, the second thing that I'd like to say is it, it, it seems like sometimes you don't see the forest through the trees. And it seems like we're trying to change our infrastructure around the tourists. I've traveled quite a bit all over the world, and other places that have this problem, they change the tourist traffic around the infrastructure. My suggestion is twofold. One is that you do what other pl great places have, is they pre-sell their tickets. They sell them in blocks of one or two hours, and you can allow people and control how much traffic you have on the peak at one time. That's one suggestion. It may be a little bit inconvenient for the tourists, but as long as they have plenty of advance notice and people know that, other great places in the world do this. The other thing is, this is a city maintained road that we also have this beautiful park down on Ridge Road. Why don't you have your tourist buses start from the Ridge Road Park down there and have a big pull off, you already have the property down there, and control the tourist traffic in the buses from Ridge Road up to the top of Pikes Peak. So you're, you're, you're controlling the tourists in two, two different ways, pre-selling the tickets for private vehicles. You're also controlling the shuttle buses and how many come out of there per hour during the, the tourist hike. And sometimes I think that we want to throw millions and millions and millions of dollars at things, and we're really not, we're not solving anything. We're still going to have this tourist problem. So my suggestion is try and control the tourists and not the infrastructure. Great. Appreciate the suggestion. 
And I think there were there were two main suggestions in that. And I just want to make sure, Lisa, you were right. It looks like you're writing them down. Okay, that's great. So, uh, sir, I just want to make sure that um, leave leave your email at the back because what'll happen? What what I would like to have happen, which I, I'm pretty sure we're going to be doing here. Uh, those are questions uh, for the city of Colorado Springs. We'll get those over to the city because uh, you know they have the long-term lease with the highway uh, uh, and the Forest Service and get those suggestions to them and then we'll seek a response from the city to those comments and then we'll push that response uh, through the system that, you're, that we're setting up. So that means it'll come to you if we have your email. So I, I appreciate that. I just, I have great ideas and I'm not a very good public speaker, so you'll have to forgive me. Here you are, we're taking your- I, I do have, I, <laughs> other places use this methodology. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I do have a, I actually have a question myself, and it's not for you, sir, sorry, I didn't mean to make you stay up. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the topics that I have heard, and possibly some folks could provide an answer to this, one of the challenges about traveling west on 24 uh, particularly when the traffic going up Pikes Peak Highway is very heavy, is tourists not always realizing they need to be in the left lane. So they go up in the right lane and then afterwards realize they needed to be in the left lane. So then they stop and they wait for a space to open up and they effectively close down Highway 24 going west. So everybody that lives up here, I know you've been through that, right? Yeah. yeah. So here's my question, and I'll uh, direct this to the Highway Patrol and to CDOT. Uh, I mean, the ultimate solution, which is impossible in the near term, is a third lane. I'm not even going to have a conversation about that. Uh, but uh, it's my understanding the possibility could exist that there could be some uh, signage that says something along the lines of, if you're going up the highway, stay in the left lane, something to that effect. And CDOT... <laughs> Sorry? I'm sorry? They stay in the left lane all the way up. Oh, it is at 30 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, but you see, if, right. What I'm saying is if, if they're, they're all in the left lane, that's true. But some of them also go in the right lane not realizing they're going to be turning left. So they block both lanes, and then nobody can get up Highway 24. So, I mean, you know... It, it's better to have all the traffic in one lane so at least everybody else can still travel through. So the question for CDOT is, is there a possibility from, for some signage that could at least make that notice? And then for the state patrol, I assume you run into that and you try to deal with it. So I'll start with CDOT and then ask you. So I've talked to our maintenance folks and we'll have additional variable message boards out there to designate which lane to get into in advance. Um, it, it is a, it's a tough formula. Where do you want to get folks to move over? I mean, you don't want them in that left turn lane all the way to Manitou, but at the same time, if they don't get into the lane, they're not going to get into it. So there's some, some additional devices we can put out there, cones, we call them vertical panels, and in some cases to really designate that lane. Once you're in it, you're in it. And I, I think they used that last year. I think it was it was as effective as it, effective as it could be. Um, it was not. Okay. It, it trapped people in that lane, which was not a good thing. Okay. I'm going to let State Patrol maybe talk about that because they they did a better job uh, addressing that. I'm I they tried. It was I, tourists. They may be able to answer that question better than I can. So I'm going to hand it over to the State Patrol, but the bottom line is we'll, we'll have VMS boards in advance to designate uh, the left turning, the, the traffic that needs to get in that left turn lane. Yeah, I don't even know where to start with this one. Um, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. I work those roads 10 hours a day. Signage would help, but it's an education process that I think should probably start with the website where they're buying their tickets and explaining some clear-cut directions on, on how to get up the hill. Because when they're driving up those mountains, they're not looking at signs, believe me. The speed limit sign's the last thing they're looking at. <laughs> and when I ask them, you know, do you know how fast you're going? Well, I'm not from here. Okay, well, no disrespect, but our speed limit signs look just like the ones you have in your home state. <laughs> um, it, I think it's really just an educational process, because they are, they're tourists. And I don't want to badmouth tourists, because we need the revenue and everything. But I worked Breckenridge for a lot of years. And that is a small ski town. 
I didn't get to go anywhere on the weekends because I couldn't. I did everything I needed to do during the week and it's frustrating. I have been where you're at. It, I feel your pain. But it really starts with the education process. And, and I think if we can get something on the Pikes Peak website uh, about you know directions to the mountain, clear cut, this is where you should be going. Will it help? I don't know. But we could try everything and find out what doesn't work. Uh, to that point, Lisa, I think you perhaps have taken a note that we'll, uh, we'll provide to the city about trying to get on their website, perhaps in prominent display. Uh, if you're pre-buying a ticket and you're coming up from Colorado Springs, stay in the left lane so that the right lane can stay open. At least then people can get through one of the lanes. So, yes, ma'am. My name's Allison Brink. We've lived up here since 1966. Um, there's a lot of things I want to ask. But what you were just talking about, I really appreciate this meeting. I was one that emailed you. I appreciate Pikes Peak responding to me last year and the State Patrol trying to do the separate lanes <clears throat> to alleviate the traffic. It didn't work, but everybody tried. Um, so I appreciate that a lot. Okay, <laughs> on that intersection, we're gonna to have to also look at how the business is gonna get traffic from the eastbound before that intersection. And when you're turning left onto Fountain Road, if somebody's trying to turn into Colorado Wines, you only get one car and the second one's stuck hanging out in the intersection. So that'll have to be addressed too. Um, ooh. The orange construction sign for the right turn is actually working a little better than anything has at this point. I don't know why, but it is. People are still turning right on red. You know, it says straight through only the sign. The signage is there and no one's paying, it, paying attention to it. Um, on the shuttles going up the peak, where is that being proposed that the buses are gonna be? Yeah, uh, let me try to address that, and, and uh, um, I can be corrected if someone knows better. There's actually a mix, and that's, I think, perhaps why there, there is um, sometimes a little bit of confusion, because there's going to be some companies that are going to be offering shuttle services from the springs, and they're going to reduce the number of cars that go up the highway. But then the city itself is offering van service, but that will be behind the gate, and that isn't necessarily going to reduce traffic issues in front of the gate. What that's going to do is deal with other traffic issues that's on their own road, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's my understanding there's going to be a couple of parking locations where um, tourists can park on the highway. One of them, I think, is that parking area where the uh, race starts. Mm -hmm. And then I think also, uh, what are some of the other places, Lisa, where they might... At 16 Mile will be another place. So okay. there's going to be a mix of a couple places, and, and that's going to help with their own internal traffic, but isn't necessarily beneficial for the challenges you have down here. Yeah. But to the other side, right, there are going to be um, more companies a, um, offering uh, the, uh, the, the shuttle service right. that is outside the gate, and that's going to help a little bit. Okay. So it's a combination of the two. Oh, let's see. Long-term planning. I went to the meetings 10, 15 years ago about the long-term planning on widening the corridor 24 up to Manitou, which we're not there yet. <clears throat> and I brought this up then. If we are actually long-term planning, we need to look at Mount Hermon Road, we, which is off of Rampart Range. And yes, there is environmental and all that stuff, but you deal with the same thing, widening 24 with all the old dumps and oil and everything you have to do with that. So that's another, I mean, that's a long-term plan that would be really beneficial, I think, for everybody to look at. Lisa, you got that? Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I, I don't have an answer to that one. We're just going to take okay. that one. And, yeah, I yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> and then on that intersection, too, the left turn lane from the sunny side of Cascade is what we call it. And then turning left, that's almost a 45-degree turn. 
that would help them a lot if you would pull that barrier back and they could ease that turn instead of trying to get a truck. It goes in both lanes no matter how you do it. Okay, great. Um, we'll take that. School Suggestion. buses from Ute Pass Elementary, because of the intersection right up here, have already been ordered to redirect down to the stoplights. They're not allowed to cross up here anymore. I was just told that a couple weeks ago. So it's getting dangerous enough for the school to make their so buses. So they're, they're, for, for a safety purpose, you're telling, mm -hmm. you're saying that they're only going to use the traffic light right. intersection and at this point. Right, and not this one right up here. Yeah. So that's going to okay. add to that. I could see that because I know that those other intersections that don't have traffic lights with all the traffic on them, they're kind of dangerous. You yeah. really have to pay attention. And then when you're in a bus that doesn't go very fast from an acceleration point of view, you know, mm -hmm. you've got to wait for a lot of space on that road before you cross it. And I have a yeah. question for State Patrol. Can you guys put out a map with mileposts? Because I'm used to calling and saying, at Cusack's Corner, at... <laughs> and they're going, what milepost is that? <laughs> no, for a person created their own, there's not the one that's actually produced. I don't know if CDOT has a pretty good has job with maps. Where? CDOT has one on their site. I've looked for it. Okay. Leave your email. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so that's easier. They always ask, what milepost is this at? That out. Put that out on the information page as well. Yeah, that would be nice. Okay. okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. I'm William Kebaugh from Colorado Springs. And I know that construction is going to be starting on the uh, Pikes Peak Summit House here soon. And I know that's just going to add to traffic up here because the Cog Railway is not going to be able to take any of the, uh, the uh, tourists, any of the supplies. What do you expect to have happen here? Yes, uh, I, I don't know the exact start date for the construction. Does anybody have that? Um, so June 4th? Okay, thank you. So obviously it's going to be relevant this summer. And uh, that means construction workers. It also means heavy vehicles, right? That's going to be going up there. Per, I, I'll, 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 I'll speculate here for a moment. Perhaps the city's desire to have vans inside the gate is to reduce the traffic so that the construction traffic uh, has a little bit more space. Uh, that might be part of, you want to work on? OK, thank you. You're th throwing me a line. I appreciate it. Maybe a little help here. Uh, Jack Laven again, manager. Uh, construction will start. What the plan is, GE Johnson's our contractor. They're local. All supplies, our goal is to have the supplies delivered before we open to visitors so that they're off the mountain. The construction workers are going to probably go through the gate about 6 o'clock. They're going to shuttle from the ski area up so that they'll also try to minimize uh, congestion up there. And then our shuttle workers, when we're offering the shuttle service inside the gateway, they're going to come early through about 6.30 through the gate so that we're trying to keep it minimize, minimized impact for the visitors. So the construction should go through most of the summer and then into October and then we'll start precast down below in the fall and then start again. Three year project right now. So more information again, pikespeakcolorado.com. We got newsletters and so you can see that information. All right, great. That was a great question, and I think that was actually a pretty good answer that I didn't know either. So uh, they're, they're paying attention uh, to the, the traffic load that would be there during the tourist day. Yes, sir, another question. And, and kind of a follow-up. Uh, are there long-term plans to keep the shuttle services beyond? Good question. Now, right now, it's we're calling it temporary shuttle during construction. What we'll do is watch it, but if there's a lot of congestion, we're also looking at maybe a voluntary shuttle after construction. So then we could see what that looks like. And the Volpe uh, Institute that did the studies for Garden of the Gods and us kind of gave us some numbers if we did a follow-on. So yes, I think it's going to be something we're going to definitely look at, as well as traffic control reservations, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. All right, sir. Eric Caldwell, Green Mountain Falls. I was just wondering if there's been any thought to the large percentage of people that use Google Maps, Apple Maps, that kind of stuff to get up here. And working with them, instead of having traffic signs, just changing the GPS directions to Pikes Peak so that it tells them to get over when they're supposed to get over instead of 
it tells them to get over like right at the intersection. I don't know if CDOT does that or the county or who would work with them, but. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's, it, it's, it's a good question. I think Lisa is taking it down. And if I recall right, we had a similar kind of challenge uh, in the uh, West Colorado Avenue construction. Uh, there's apparently a way to interact with Google to get them to say certain things that actually helps with traffic, but you've got to actually research that to figure out it's not an obvious thing when you're interacting with them. That's And Lisa, maybe you can talk about what you went through to try to deal with that, because you might have done that this one time already. We, we did, um, exactly, So that came up from another individual, um, as Commissioner said, and we have contacted Google, so we're working with them, and then also Waze. So I'm going to take a quick poll. How many people use Waze, W-A-Z-E? And how many use Google Maps? <laughs> More Google Maps. So, but a little of both. So the city of Colorado Springs works closely with Waze, so we're working with them on how to put things up there. We also got with CDOT, and they've got a website called CoTrip. And, um, it pops up now when you put your cursor over the area where that West Side Avenue project is. It pops up um, road construction underway. Don't rely on GPS. Call ahead to your destination for the best route and detours because it, it, it's not every day that project is changing the detour. So those are the three things. And then it was posted on the project website as well. It pops up the minute you go on the website, really, really big and prominent. So we're exploring several ways to do that. Awesome. Thank you. So, and I, I appreciate that comment as well, because in addition to the signs on the side of the road that uh, CDOT may be able to do, uh, for those that do use social media, right, to get around, and I'm one of them, and I think probably everybody does to one degree or another, we could maybe get that kind of an announcement about trying to stay in the left lane, which won't solve the problem, but there'll be a few drivers that will be following that, and that will certainly help. So thank you so much. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, I'm Troy Easton, a longtime resident, and I commute to Denver several times a week, so I spend a lot of time going down the past to 25. Um, I also went to Manitou High School, and I know that right in front of the cliff dwellings, there's almost accidents there constantly. It's the quickest way for the kids up here that go to high school in Manitou to get to school, and I was wondering if we can just get a traffic light there already. Um, we see it all the time, and it's only getting worse with the amount of traffic going up and down. I have four daughters that are getting ready to get into junior high school, so I'm awfully concerned what it's going to be like in six years if you guys haven't done anything about it in 30 years. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you want to? Yeah, no, this is a, this has been a, a big issue. So we do have a, a scientific way to put traffic signals in. So uh, it's kind of complicated, but we've studied this intersection quite a few times. So um, <clears throat> there's accidents and there's volumes. And so this one wasn't near the accident warrant, which is pretty low. The volume one, it kind of got up there, but we've been talking about possibly doing a ride in, ride out. So I know that's not popular, but uh, the Cliff Dwellings is the one who has proposed this idea. So I think we're gonna run it up there and uh, see how it goes over. So it's a good test case here. I, I don't think it's a bad idea, but okay. it's the safest it, way. It'll just con congest the 31st Avenue intersection that much more, won't it? Well, no, so you're thinking the U-turn would be at 31st? There's an opportunity before that. So at Ridge, it'll be the a Ridge three-quarter. Ridge Road, which you can't go back. You could, yeah, now, but that's being reconfigured to be okay. a three-quarter. So there would be an option there. So it might be safer with 31st gating that as a signal. So as it turn, turns red, you could do your U-turn. But I think there's other opportunities before that. It's just a one idea. So the signal- Aren't traffic light, lights, I mean, are they that expensive to, to throw well, in? Well, no. So once you put a traffic signal in, accidents go up. So people don't realize this, right? <laughs> but so the rear ends go up, and so what? So we try in high-speed corridors, when you put traffic signals in, uh, the severity of the accidents also goes up, because it's high-speed. Okay. So we, we're pretty scientific about it and cautious, so. All right. Um, but we are gonna look at this one. So we studied it August 3rd of last year, and he's like, no, 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 let's do July, the third weekend. I was like, all right, we'll, we'll give it a shot this summer, so. Okay. Uh, take another look. Second question, with the amount of traffic volume going up and down anymore to Woodland Park and everything, uh, you can just constantly hear the road. Is there any sort of um, asphalt materials that can deaden the sound, a rubberized asphalt or anything like that that can be done? Just 
<laughs> you know, CDOT's experimented so of the other states with uh, rubberized asphalt or open graded mixes. Uh, we prefer the open graded mixes. They're they're not as, as expensive, and you get that longer term benefit. The the rubberized asphalt is really expensive, and I know the city has used that pretty extensively, and they're kind of reversing their their thought process on rubberized asphalt. What happens over time with a with an asphalt is as it ages, it it still hardens, um, and it that that noise factor does come back. So you don't get that long-term benefit that you would you would like to see. So our, we've had success with open graded mixes, which is a lot more voids in the surface that doesn't invite that that sucking sound that you get with the tire going over it. So um, we can look at those options for resurfacing, and uh, and so I think you're going to see a quieter roadway when we resurface anyway because we get we get a, a certainly a noise reduction just from the, the, the resurfacing and over time it just gets noisier um i hope that answered your question i have one more sure. question for you you were talking about they're going to start doing the fencing and maybe scaling or whatever of you pass again right putting the, over the rocks you said when is that? That's in June too? We're starting this June, but we're going to only work during the off-peak peak hours. Are we going to be going shifting to one side of the pass, going up and down? We have to in some, with some, with some construction we do, we're going to, we do what we call rock scaling. Mm -hmm. We get essentially workers up on the side of the hill and they, they dislodge rocks. Right. And so during those events, um, we're going to shift it to one side of the road or the other. Okay. But again, it's going to be between 9 and 3. That's where we see the big drop-off in traffic. And then again, the, the heavy tourist period, we're going to stay out of that, and certainly on the weekends. Nothing after Friday at noon um, until Monday morning. When are the races this year? Pikes Peak Hill Point? I think we're going to shut down around the 19th, 20th oh, of June. <laughs> no work until after the hill climb. So it's it's going to be a rough year, no matter how we look. Yeah, at it. I mean, it. <laughs> next year when we do the surface treatment job up to, we'll do. We're going to have to do that at night. Yeah. There's just too much traffic on the road. Uh, so I appreciate, uh, yeah, um, please come up and I, I have a couple of uh, quick comments. First of all, again, continue to uh, think about comments that you have and Lisa mentioned I think there's an ability to make those comments in the back if you don't want to come up to the microphone. I would also like to encourage, uh, first of all, I want to uh, say thank you. I'll, I'll thank everybody again in a minute, but I'd like to thank all of the public agencies that are here to, who came here to talk to you, to talk about the things that they are doing. But I would also like them to encourage them to continue to think about ways to solve the problem. So we've got a list that's up on the charts. We're going to implement those and see how it works. But if it does, if it, if it solves the problem part way, but doesn't really get us far enough, I would, I would seek the flexibility of everybody involved, the public agencies that are involved, to try additional things. Because we will have challenges up here this summer with Cog Railway closing and some of these other things. To the to the issue of the rock fall that was mentioned, uh, you know, uh, unfortunate about having to move over from one side to the other. But we're talking about citizen safety at this point on that kind of a project. Yeah, so it just has to be done. Yes, sir. Uh, Tom and Dobson. I think this might be yeah, the last Tom question. Dobson with Green Mountain Falls. But yes, sir. A question for the Pikes Peak Highway. It seems to me if if you move your shuttles way down st or uh, towards Manitou or Color Springs, it would eliminate some of the congestion on the highway. It would, it would just take care of all many of these problems that we've discussed all the way through. Um, or maybe if you need to have third party contractors do it, are you willing to discount the tickets so that the, the consumer is economically indifferent, whether he catches a, a third party shuttle at 30th Street or picks up a ticket and your free shuttle later on. But I think you could do a lot with uh, relieving the Highway 24 and the interchange congestion by doing that. Uh, we've, we're looking at that long term, but you got to remember, no matter what you do, you have moved the parking somewhere. Yeah. And if you think of where you got parking 
I can't name too many places that you can park. You got the high schools or you got something else that's happening. And then you got to, who's subsidizing this, the shuttles? Uh, Gray Line's charging $65 a person. We give them a discount, they get a discount, $10 in the entry fee. So who's paying for that? Uh, right now, our shuttle, just on the surface, we're going to pay about $2 million to have the shuttle on Pikes Peak. So who's going to subsidize that? Is that going to come from us or the patrons? Well, that's, that's so, due to your construction project. You're not doing yep. that out of the benevolence. Right, but the then city. where are you going to park downtown? Um, if you, I can't think of many places we've looked at it. You got Rockledge Ranch, that's not really a good option. High schools, well, they start school, and then you got those options. So I understand what you're saying. It sounds good economically. Nowhere, I, I don't know of any place that isn't subsidizing buses. If you go to Maroon Bells, oh. if you go to anywhere, they're subsidizing that. Who's subsidizing it? Taxpayers? And that, and that, sir, is why I'm asking the yep. city of Colorado Springs with the Pikes Peak Highway. Uh, yeah, we can okay, afford you're, to you're, subsidize you need to, it. You need to dig deep a little bit and help the problem uh, out. We're trying, but okay. I don't think, you know, it sounds good, but Thank you. Um, we'll look at the economics, but right now, if you run them, it's not economically feasible. And that's why you don't see bus tours running it. You know, Chuck, Chuck Murphy's going to run it because the cog's not running. But he wasn't running it beforehand because guess what? There wasn't that demand and he couldn't, you know, basically he couldn't afford it. So. All right, thank you very much. We are at eight o'clock and we do need to be respectful of your time. First of all, I wanna thank all of you, the residents that live here for coming here. I hope the series of presentations we gave you has been helpful and informative. I'm encouraged by the number of actions that are taking place and we will continue to monitor that. Again, please make sure you sign up in the back if you haven't done so already. And I'd also like to extend my thanks to the public agencies, the Highway Patrol, CDOT, the City of Colorado Springs, El Paso County, uh, and others that are here to talk to you tonight. So thank you very, very much, and I hope this was helpful. We'll stay around a few more minutes if you have further questions, and thanks for coming very, very much.